The benefits cap rolled out across Britain from today. Ministers say it's already pushing claimants into work. Families will get no more than £26,000 a year. The government hits back at critics who say it's not fair. People by and large believe this is the right thing. Fairness to taxpayers as well as fairness to people who are out of work. The changes come at a time of increasing pressure in the housing market. We'll have a special report. Also tonight... The Ministry of Defence names one of the two army reservists who died while training in the Brecon Beacons. The cross-channel charity swim that ended in tragedy. Susan Taylor was raising funds for a hospice. Oil drills as far as the eye can see. Why America's new oil bonanza could be bad news for environmental activists. You have to dig deeper. It costs more. It takes more energy. But here's the key thing. There's plenty left. The oil is not running out. Tonight on BBC London, killed coming to the aid of his neighbour. Police say the suspected attacker was on day release from prison. And the mayor's latest plans for an airport to replace Heathrow. Good evening and welcome to the BBC's News at Six. The benefits cap is being rolled out across England, Scotland and Wales today following a trial in four London boroughs. It will mean that families on welfare will not receive more than the earnings of the average household, about £26,000 a year. Critics say the changes will hit claimants in some parts of the country unfairly, especially where housing costs are high. More on that in a moment, but first here's our deputy political editor, James Landale, on a major change in the welfare system. How much should one family be able to claim in benefits? It's a question the government hopes will dominate the next election, a question to which they hope they've got the most popular answer, a cap of £26,000 a year. People on welfare who are not in work, apart from the exemptions, such as those who are disabled, etc., uh, they should actually not be earning more than average earnings netted out after tax, uh, which you know is fair to taxpayers who are themselves often struggling on marginal low and average earnings uh, and don't want to see people who are on welfare not working earning more than they are. The welfare cap covers out-of-work benefits like job seekers allowance and housing and child benefit. It'll affect only 40,000 households, mostly in London, and it'll save only £110 million this year. That's less than a tenth of 1% of the whole welfare budget. But those large families that are affected, critics say, will be hit hard. And here in Manchester, there were some concerns. The percentage of people that do claim benefits unfairly is minute, and they get, they get, uh, they get targeted, and therefore everybody suffers. £500, nothing today. £500 won't solve our deficit. Take it off the MPs, take it off the people who put it, take it off the bankers. You see other people who've been in a situation through no fault of their own and they need to be able to sort of fund a lifestyle that is, well, not even a lifestyle, they need to be able to get off the breadline. But across the country, the welfare cap is hugely popular, backed by 70% of people, according to a new opinion poll. And a third of those who oppose it do so because they think the cap is too high. I think people get too much on benefits. I think to cap it is right. I'd be happy with 350 quid a week. I'd be able to live like a king on that. Because that's enough for anyone. You know, I, I can live on that, so... And I've got a child, and I don't get no help at all. And that's why the Conservatives are going to try to make welfare a key issue at the next election. They believe they have an advantage over Labour on this, branding it the Welfare Party because of its historic reluctance to cut benefits. But Labour is fighting back, no longer saying the cap is wrong, just that it won't work. We think a benefit cap is a good idea in principle. It's a shame today's cap has proved such a shambles in practice. So we've learned today that there are 4,000 families, that's about 10%, with big numbers of children who won't actually come under this cap when it's introduced. So benefits are now a key political battleground, with no party willing to appear soft where public opinion is so hard line. The challenge for ministers is to make sure the cap fits. If it doesn't, they'll pay a price at the election. James Landell, BBC News, Westminster. 
Well, one of the biggest costs for any family, whether on benefits or not, is housing. According to a new study published today, homes in a third of Britain are now too expensive for people on lower incomes. As our home editor Mark Easton reports, much of southern England is now a no-go area for poorer families. Hunting for a modest home for your family. Great swathes of southern England are now, it's claimed, beyond the reach of low-income households. For young workers looking to stay cool in the capital, trying to find a decent place to live is a hot topic. We're spending up to 50% of what we take home on rent. I think I'm spending even more than half of what I earn on rent. Many of you live at home with your parents. You all do. So what about your circumstances? You can't afford to get anywhere? No, I'd like to move out, but I can't. And you're trying to save for a deposit for a house, but your rent is so extortionate that there's no chance. So where can you afford to live? Well, using the BBC's new online housing calculator, let's assume you want to rent a modest two-bed home. And by modest, we mean somewhere that's cheaper than three-quarters of similar properties in an area. Paying a monthly rent of £1,000, you can afford, well, most of Britain, the green areas here. But you can't afford to live in most of London. At £700 a month, well, much of the southeast is beyond your pocket, and reduce that to £500 a month, and most of England is out of reach. These are working families on modest incomes, and they're still struggling to afford housing in large parts of the southeast. We used to think this was a London only problem, but actually, it's now spreading beyond London and the southeast to other parts of the country. The Mayor of London has described the shortage of affordable housing as the gravest crisis facing the capital. The government has promised to build 170,000 more homes and loan people money to buy. What we're focused on is building that extra 170,000 now and then from next year ramping that up so we get to the fastest rate of annual house building we've seen for 20 years. When will house prices in London and the South East start coming down? when we get a better balance between supply and demand. How long? And that's going to be uh, something that will take a little time. We, we've taken 25 years to get to this problem. It's not going to be solved in one parliament. We're, we're determined to turn it round. Private renting is often actually the most expensive type of housing. So what about buying? Mortgage repayments may be cheaper, but you're going to need a deposit. If you have £25,000 to put down, you can buy a two-bedroom property in most areas, but again, London or parts of it are going to be beyond you. If you've only got 15,000, well, the southeast is a problem, and with a deposit of 10,000 pounds, you'll struggle to get on the housing ladder in large parts of Britain. With half as many homes being built each year as are needed, the housing crisis has grown over decades. Achieving affordability may take as long again. Mark Easton, BBC News. Now, if you'd like to find out where in the UK you could afford to live and whether it is cheaper to rent or buy, you can crunch the numbers using that BBC calculator. That's at bbc.co.uk forward slash business. Well, let's uh, return to Westminster and join our deputy political editor, James Landale, who's uh, there for us now. Going to these benefit changes, uh, James, economically, I, I guess it will save a fraction of the welfare budget, but, but I assume politically much more is at stake. Yes, that's right, George. I mean, compared to most of the government's other welfare reforms and spending cuts, this is a relatively modest affair in terms of the number of people it actually affects and the actual amount of money it would save. But politically, it's absolutely crucial. For the Conservatives, not just because they believe they have an advantage over Labour on this, but also because they believe this policy, if you like, is a symbol for everything else they're trying to do on welfare. This idea that they say that benefits shouldn't be seen as a lifestyle choice. This idea that you can make cuts in their view and still encourage people to get a job and get into work. For Labour, their challenge is to match this Conservative attack without actually promising to spend any more money on their natural supporters, some of whom are actually quite concerned by Labour's apparent willingness to harden up their support for a cap in principle. So the bottom line is that for all the questions about this policy in terms of how many people it will actually help into work in the long run, how much money it will actually save if councils have to step in to fill the gaps, how many large vulnerable families might be caught in a loophole. For all those questions, the bottom line is this policy is hugely popular with the voters. The, the government knows that, and so they're going to milk it for all it's worth. All right, James, thanks very much. Thank you.
The Ministry of Defence has named one of the two men who died during a military exercise on the Brecon Beacons at the weekend. He was Lance Corporal Craig Roberts, who was trying out for the Territorial Army's SAS section. Another soldier who died hasn't been named. A third man who collapsed remains in hospital. Let's go live to our Wales correspondent, Howell Griffith, who joins us from the Brecon Beacons. Howell. George, these mountains form an open, exposed landscape that offer little shelter from the snow in winter or from the sun at this time of year. On Saturday, temperatures here reached 30 degrees Celsius. The soldiers training here would have expected it to be hot. They would have been told to carry litres of water. But that exercise ended with two of them losing their lives. Exhausted and in danger. These photographs show the soldiers waiting to be rescued from the Brecon Beacons after six of the group collapsed on the hottest day of the year. The Beacons have been used by the British Army for oh, decades as a place to test endurance. A walker who saw the group on Saturday says it was clear that they were feeling the effects of the heat. It was incredibly hot. Um, they did look very hot. They were tired in the afternoon. Um, but it did kind of seem like you would, you would normally see the soldiers when you're walking up there. One of the soldiers who died on the beacons has been named as Lance Corporal Craig Roberts. It's believed he was undergoing selection for the reserve regiments of the SAS. Only 10% are chosen after hiking alone over these ridges with weighted packs. A former Special Forces officer explained to me the pressures they're under. There's a, you know, an overwhelming desire not to fail. They've spent months and months and months preparing for this. You know, this isn't something they would have just walked straight into. There would have been months of build-up training for this. So they'll be totally determined to actually get to the end of it. These aren't the first military deaths on these mountains this year. In January, an army captain died during a similar SAS test. Tonight, the Ministry of Defence is investigating alongside the police to see whether more should have been done to protect its recruits. Howell Griffith, BBC News, in the Brecon Beacons. Lancashire police have received more sexual abuse allegations against the former television presenter Stuart Hall. The 83-year-old was jailed last month after admitting 14 counts of indecent assault against girls as young as nine between 1967 and 1987. Police say they're working with the Crown Prosecution Service to decide whether to press new charges. A man suspected of attacking a paedophile in Hertfordshire and then murdering his 66-year-old neighbour was on day release from prison. Police say the suspect, Ian McLaughlin, is very dangerous and should not be approached. The man who was killed, Graham Buck, was described as totally selfless for trying to stop the attack. An independent review has called for changes to end-of-life care in hospitals in England. Under the Liverpool Care Pathway used across the country, terminally ill patients should have had a peaceful, pain-free death. But the study found that the reality could sometimes be quite different. Here's our medical correspondent, Fergus Walsh. Dignity for the dying. That was the aim of the Care Pathway designed in Liverpool and widely used in the UK. But the review found it was misused and misunderstood by some hospitals, with shocking reports of poor treatment. They thought it was OK for junior doctors particularly to put people on the Liverpool Care Pathway uh, in the middle of the night, at weekends, on bank holidays, with no senior people involved. I think the communications tended to be really awful. And I think in some places, the quality of care was very poor and sometimes lacking compassion. Their report found echoes of the appalling negligence revealed by the mid-staff scandal, with dying patients desperate for a drink being denied fluids, despite the pleas of relatives. The family of 82-year-old Philip Charlesworth say they only found out he was on the Liverpool Care pathway when they were told not to give him a drink, but let him suck water from a sponge. They argue his death amounted to euthanasia. Looking at him, you wouldn't let a dog go through this, and that's exactly summed up how he felt, because we thought it was cruel, inhumane. He clearly was fighting to survive. The review says the Liverpool Care Pathway should be phased out within a year and replaced with personalised end-of-life plans. 
Senior doctors must be involved in decisions to withdraw treatment and there should be an end to incentive payments for hospitals using the system. The Department of Health in England says the changes will be made. Scotland and Northern Ireland will review their use of the Liverpool Care Pathway. Wales has its own system. The question is whether all hospitals can replace what became a tick box culture with personalised and compassionate care for the dying. Fergus Walsh, BBC News. A mother accused of starving and murdering her son at their home in Coventry has told a court she was prevented from feeding him by his stepfather. Magdalena Luchak claimed Marius Krechelek hated four-year-old Daniel Pelka and had punished him almost every day. The pair, both originally from Poland, deny charges of murder and causing or allowing Daniel's death. Jeremy Cook reports. Daniel Pelka was four years old when he died in March last year. His body was emaciated. He had suffered a fatal head wound. His own mother, Magdalena Wuczak, is accused of killing her son. Both she and her boyfriend, Marius Krezolek, deny murder. Both admit child cruelty. In court today, Magdalena Wuczak described how her partner repeatedly punished Daniel. There would, she said, be acts of violence at home. She said Marius Krezolek became very angry with the four-year-old when he learned he was taking sandwiches from other children at school. Daniel's mother told the court that her partner had prevented her from feeding her son. She also said that he'd punished the four-year-old by making him kneel in the corner, run around and do squats. Asked what she did about it, she said, Daniel didn't listen to me, so at first I thought it was good that Marius was stopping him taking the sandwiches. But she added that later she thought the punishment had gone far enough. She said her partner's relationship with Daniel had started well, but that eventually he had come to hate him. Today would have been Daniel Palka's sixth birthday. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Birmingham Crown Court. And the time is 17 minutes past six. Our top story this evening. The benefits cap rolls out across Britain. No family will receive more than £26,000. And still to come, too cool for school. The children who got their own personal snowfall to cope with the heat wave. Later on BBC London, a cyclist is killed in a collision with a lorry. The second cycling death on the capital's roads in 10 days. And could London beat Paris again, this time to host the Gay Games in 2018? The Deputy Prime Minister backs the bid. The future of fuel and its cost is something we'll be looking at this week. We all use it and we're constantly being told that the world is running out of oil. But a new frontier has opened up in America. From Alaska in the north to Texas in the south, vast quantities of oil are being drilled. This year, the U.S. is set to produce an average of 7.3 million barrels of oil a day. That's just behind Saudi Arabia, which pumps out 9.7 million barrels. But by 2020, America may be on course to match that. Our science editor, David Shookman, has been to one of the oil fields in California, where some of the most intense drilling is taking place. The rhythm of pumps pulling oil from the ground, the beating heart of every modern economy. This is California, but not as most people know it. In one of the largest oil fields on the planet, the baked ground is swept bare. An entire landscape stretches for miles, given over to the extraction of oil from the rock below and it keeps producing. It's an incredible sight, with more than 10,000 of these pumps drawing up the oil. This field has been producing for more than a century, and whenever anyone thinks it might run dry, someone comes along and either finds more oil or comes up with a new way of getting at it. The result, as in many parts of the world, there's more oil than previously thought. The owner of one of the oil fields here takes me to one of his sites. We've been pumping oil like this for 100 years here. This is big oil country, and Fred Holmes has the stuff in his blood. His grandfather and father worked in the wells. He owns 600 of these pumps, and he says there's still a lot of oil. 
Oh, there's enough oil in this country for another hundred years, you know, with our present technology and, and a lot of natural gas. And around the world, there's a lot of oil to be found yet. Oil once burst from the ground here. This well gushed uncontrollably for months in 1910. Over the decades, the oil fields have kept adapting. And new technology now means America is on course, amazingly, to produce as much oil as Saudi Arabia. International experts say America's oil fortunes have suddenly been transformed. Things have changed very rapidly. Now, the change has really occurred in a very uh, short period of a couple of years. Uh, if you look at the forecast of two years ago, uh, most people expected uh, continuing decline in production. Uh, and now it's a very, very different situation, very different outlook. And it really happened very, very quickly. So where does this leave alternative energy? This dense mass of wind turbines stands not far from the oil fields. A new flood of oil could undermine moves to get away from fossil fuels. We need to win the battle against this big new oil boom in California. We have to win it in California, where we pride ourselves on being a leader in responding to the climate crisis. Because if we can't win it in California, where in the United States can we win it? But huge new reserves of oil are being developed, and the stuff itself is in hot demand. It is becoming harder to get oil out of the ground. You have to dig deeper, it costs more, it takes more energy. But here's the key thing, there's plenty left. The oil is not running out. The latest sources of oil may not be all that easy to exploit, but the oil era that dawned in these hills is far from over. David Truckman, BBC News in California. And there's more information on oil drilling in the United States on the BBC website. That's at bbc.co.uk forward slash future fuel. And tomorrow we'll be reporting from Texas on how gas produced by the controversial process of fracking is due to be shipped to Britain. A woman has died while swimming the English Channel for charity. Susan Taylor died in Bologna on Sunday after getting into difficulty during her swim. She was doing the 21-mile endurance test to raise money for a hospice in Leicestershire. Robert Hall reports. Determined and dedicated, Susan Taylor had set herself a personal challenge so that others might benefit. At 34, she'd given up her job as an accountant to train for the swim, and her supporters believed she was ready for the 21-mile journey a journey which her friends could follow via a website called Creator Ripple. A journey which would raise funds for Diabetes UK and the Rainbow Children's Hospice in Loughborough. Today, hospice staff expressed their shock at the news and their sympathy for Susan's family. We really genuinely could not believe it. Um, I think as the days progressed, it's, it's sheer devastation now. Um, we all thought the world of, of Susan, she was a remarkable woman, and uh, we've got to know her very well over the last few years. Um, we just can't believe it, really can't believe it. Every cross-channel swim must be approved by the British authorities. On this occasion, with the weather set fair, they'd agreed that several swimmers could make the attempt. Susan Taylor began her preparations at Dover in the early hours of yesterday morning. Her husband and her brother were to travel on the support boat. Susan Taylor had set off from the beach at Samphire Ho, just west of Dover Harbour, following a route regularly used by channel swimmers. Late in the afternoon, she got into difficulties near Cap Grenet, and at five o'clock, her support boat crew called the French police for help. Susan Taylor was taken to hospital in Boulogne, but doctors were unable to save her. Her endeavour was not in vain. To date, she has raised more than £13,000 for her chosen charities. Robert Hall, BBC News, Dover. The heat wave that has brought the hottest weekend of the year to the UK is set to last at least another week. The hot weather has meant soaring sales of barbecue food and paddling pools. But the heat has also caused transport problems and, in separate incidents, two men died while swimming in reservoirs. John Kay reports. It's starting to feel normal. At Portishead Lido near Bristol, they've now had two weeks of sunshine. It's been packed 
every day. I can't remember the last time we had a summer like this. I can't remember being able to sit outdoors, eat my tea till nine o'clock at night. What a contrast. Let's have more of it. Well, the World Meteorological Organisation suggests a heat wave is where you've got five days of temperatures above average by five degrees. By that definition, yes, it's a heat wave and yes, it's going to continue. In fact, the weather's probably going to stay like this, really, until pretty much the end of the month. After a weekend of fun, today it's been back to work and for many that's been quite an ordeal. Tonight there are delays in and out of Waterloo because tracks have buckled in the heat. Part of the M25 around London had to be closed when the road surface started melting. As this weather persists, it probably will get worse because it's not just the surface of the road, it's the subsurface that dries out, gets hard and leaves little room for expansion. So yes, I think we will see some more roads suffering from this sunburn. Hello, Beryl. All right, yes, yeah, that. Public health officials have put out heat warnings. Charities like Contact the Elderly here in Somerset have been checking older people. Beryl's staying out of the sun and keeping hydrated. It is absolutely draining. You feel exhausted at times, as though the strength has been taken from you. There have been warnings too about the dangers of swimming in lakes and reservoirs after a number of deaths in the last few days. Things like um, currents, uh, the thermal difference in temperature of the water which can provide a massive shock to, uh, to a person in the water. For retailers, the sunshine means sales of some items are as high as the mercury. In the last two weeks, uh, barbecue sales were up 204%, wow. including our charcoal and fuels were up 176%. And last weekend alone, we sold 3 million sausages and 1.4 million burgers. Ice cream sales are also up, but this school in Hertfordshire got rather more than that today. A truckload of snow from a local ski centre. How cool is that? I think we could do with some snow here at Porter's Head Lido this evening. It's another very warm night and uh, interestingly compared with a year ago, middle of July last year they'd had about 9,000 people through the gates here. So far this summer they've had nearly 29,000. It's an astonishing difference and just talking to people who've been here today, several of them have said to me, you know what, after this sunshine we've had, we've decided to stay put in the UK for our summer holidays this year rather than grabbing a last minute deal abroad. George. John, thank you very much.